Bob, when you first came here to Wold Newton, when your dad came here, yeah. he actually walked everything down the road, I we think. Did. Yes, we did indeed. <clears throat> In 1934, uh, we moved from North Ormsby to Wold Newton, where my father was uh, farming, of course, to get the livestock here. It's about three to four miles. And we drove all the uh, sheep and the cattle and the horses from North Ormsby to Wall Newton. The four of us, my two brothers, my eldest sister and myself, we walked them here. Shepherd would get the sheep out for us in the morning, put them onto the road and, and we would uh, drive them here. So when we, there's four of us, we had one walking on either side, one at the front and one at the back. The reason was the hedges were so, so bad in those days that we, you couldn't keep them on the road, so we had to do it like that. And we got them in the, got the last lot of sheep in the field on the sale day. I was seven, uh, my next brother George was eight, uh, Marshall was nine and Joe was ten. How many horses are we talking about? I mean, how many horses would you have had back at the old farm and how many did you have here? In those days, 1,800 acres uh, at North Ormsby, we had uh, around 25 horses there. We drove those here, possibly in in, in two groups. One was uh, bridled. The uh, Wagner would lead that horse. The horse would know him and all the other horses would know him and they would uh, follow. It's amazing how, how easy it was. It sounds impossible, but that's how we did it. So when you actually got established here at Wald Newton, how many horses would you have initially been dealing with? Uh, yes, we, we had uh, 16 horses on each farm here uh, at Wald Newton. That was a thousand acre farm each. And what sort of working day did the horses have? We started at uh, 6.40. The, the horses in the summertime would be got up from the field at four o'clock to be fed and cleaned and geared and, and so on. And then they went to work at, uh, at 6.40, 20 minutes to 7, and uh, we worked until uh, 9.30. From 9.30 to 10, we had a, a break. Uh, we called it lunch, but I suppose it was breakfast, really. Uh, and then the horses worked on from 10 to th- 2.30, and that was the end of their working day. All we had to do then was to yoke out and uh, get back to the farm to the stables and by three o'clock we were there and then we came back from four o'clock to five o'clock in that day and we would be uh, breaking cake or uh, dressing corn or or any jobs i mean breaking in horses was one uh, going taking them to the blacksmith and getting them reshot and so on like that to fill the day in what were you doing between three and four three and four was our meal time that was really our uh, lunch i think we called it dinner now, of course, at harvest time, you must have had to change things a bit because you had much longer working days and a lot, an awful lot more work to get through, didn't you? Uh, yes, we did. Uh, we had two binders. They were about six foot cut. Deerings, actually. Uh, Deering binders. They were very good, make, American. Uh, and we used to use two sets of horses in, in the day because it was too hard work and, and hot, sunny days and so on. We had a, a, a young boy often, and he took the horses out and changed them after probably a third of the day and then uh, uh, came back and uh, got them ready to go again at the end of the day. So in other words, you'd have one set of horses working, and then they'd do, say, a third of a day, they'd be taken out, a new set, a fresh set, would be brought in to take over, and they would work for a bit more, another third of the day, and then the original set would be brought back in having been rested, and then you would change the rest periods around the following day. the following day. Yeah. Yeah, that's how we did it. And why did your dad move here? He had a brother, George, and he had come to Lambcroft. Now, that was one of the best farms, I suppose, uh, on the Lincolnshire Walls round here. He bought it, and uh, at the time, uh, my my father was in South Ormsby, where he had three farms there in a row. Very fond of his uh, brother, and when North Ormsby came up to let, uh, my father took it. For that reason, really. He never liked it. He was only there nine years. And then we came here, as I said, in 1934, we came to Wall Newton. So what was your dad's name? Uh, John Henry. Your dad um, had started in farming I mean, from nothing like so big beginnings as, as 1,800 acres, had he? He'd started oh, yeah. from very much smaller beginnings. Oh, yes. <laughs> My father was born in uh, Horncastle, 10 High Street, Horncastle, where his father was um, a cabinet maker. And uh, obviously in those days, they all lived over the shop. 
He was born in uh, uh, 1884, and in 1888 they moved to Hamringham. That's just outside Horncastle, and it had the nickname Hungry Hamringham, so it it couldn't (laughs) have been very good, could it? (laughs) They weren't there long, but but funnily enough, the people who followed uh, father uh, and, and family were still there. Now, you know, now. And how did he get into farming in the first place? My grandfather, he married into the English family, which were very well known in the Horncastle area. They were butchers and farmers. So he thought he ought to be a farmer. My grandfather thought he ought to be a farmer, but he wasn't too successful at it. <laughs> now, your dad obviously was, and he, presumably, he started by, what, leasing the, the, the land or what? Well, they didn't buy it, of course. They hadn't that sort of money. His, his father rented it. But my father said that he, he left school when he was 12 uh, to go home and help his mother to run the farm. So his father wasn't either very interested or, 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 or couldn't manage it. I don't know what. I don't know how true that is, but he, he did say it several times. The farming must have been in the blood, though, because it stayed... Uh, with through you and and your son and continues doesn't it in the family oh yes uh, yeah we're, we're we're all in the family in the farming and at the end of the uh, last uh, world war of course uh, we were on the farms then only one man out of all the people employed by my father ever got into the services we just had to go on the farms and i was i left school uh, uh, when i was 16 um i'd been at the aston five years went there in 38 uh, and left in 43, and, and we'd worked on the farms all that time as well. Every day in the holidays, you know, it was work, work, work. <laughs> it got us into it, I can tell you that. Because <laughs> your brothers went into it as well, didn't they? Oh, yes, yeah, yeah, they're all in it, yeah. And uh, another reason my father came here was that this is two separate farms, they're a thousand acre each, uh, and he'd got three sons, and he, wanted, he didn't want any of them to, f- to farm together. So that was two sons taken care of, he thought. Why didn't he want you to farm together? Because there's always sort of disputes of one sort or another. It, it would save all that, and, and you would be on your own. You, you would got what you had, and so had your brothers, to do what you liked with it. So, when you came here, there you were, walking all those beasts and, and, and horses down the road. Yeah. And even when you came here, you say there was just, initially, the one tractor that you got. Yes, that, yeah, when we came, we hadn't a tractor at all. <laughs> we just, yeah, he bought one, a Massey a Harris. And on my wall in the office here, um, I've got a photograph, and it's a Fordson. And uh, it was on the farm uh, when we came, so it must have been on the other farm. And the horses literally, therefore, did all the jobs th- that a tractor would do these days? Oh, yes, everything uh, had to be done by horse, uh, as it did at North Ormsby, you see. And that included, well, obviously the ploughing. What else? What else would they do? Well, uh, t- talking about ploughing, we used to have uh, two, uh, two furrow ploughs and a, a single furrow plough. Uh, and these were run by um, the Wagner, the second man, and then the third man. And the third man would often be a younger person, probably only 17, maybe 18, less experienced than the older men. And he would have the one furrow, single furrow plough, and he would have to plough an acre a day. And the two furrow plough, they ploughed an acre and a half a day with three horses, you see, and two horses and a single furrow. The foreman would go um, and he'd have a long stick and he'd stick it in the hedge where you had to plough to get it in the day. It seemed a long time, getting over a thousand acres. But of course, in those days, nearly half the farm was down to lays for, for sheep. The main crop was barley. Most of the barley we grew went for malt, so that was good. We grew, only grew one field uh, of oats, and that was for the keep of the uh, horses and the sheep, uh, and, and the cattle, of course. Some was uh, cut and some were threshed. The rest of the farm, that bit probably only one field of wheat, maybe two. Little little joss we grew in those days. It was so high, and it used to go flat on the floor. And, of course, it was a bind as we had in those days, because there weren't any combines, uh, not in this country, I don't think. It was a terrible job. And the oats, of course, they used to grow long, so long. There weren't any of these shortness in those days. It was cropped on uh, roughly half the acreage, uh, and the remainder, we had uh, one-year lays, 
for the sheep in the uh, summer months. And then they went on to root crops of turnips, kale, mustard crops sometimes, and so on, for winter feed for the sheep. So the, the, the quantity of grain we got and things like that, of course, there were no fertilizers in those days, very few fertilizers. A lot of uh, farmyard manure we had, but that would only probably cover one field in, in the year. So uh, the, the yields were far less. Uh, I mean, a tonne of wheat to the acre was a good yield. Nowadays, we would expect to get around four tonnes, and the top crops, I think, are, are over five tonnes now, maybe six tonnes an acre, which is Great. phenomenal. Yes. For the uninitiated, what is a lay? Oh, lay is a, a grass crop. It's uh, grass and, uh, and clovers, a bit of sand foil and so on uh, in them. We only left it down one year. It was ploughed up every year and then uh, cropped the following year. Same with the rootland, of course. Crops were rotated. So it was more or less actually to feed the soil, to help feed the soil, yes, and, and also to rest it. Yes, it was. Yes, it was. That, that was the reason. You almost get the impression that summers must have been longer in those days so that the, to give the horses time to actually do all this work that you now do with combines, but it didn't quite work like that, did it? The summers were the same length, Roughly half the acre would be in cereal crops. Of course, there's far less of it. I suppose that's one reason why it would take less doing. But we, with the binder in it and then uh, stooking it and then leading it and stacking it, it changed a lot of the work from the summer, really, put it into the autumn and the winter. And we were probably uh, threshing until New Year. We had no dryers or anything like that in those days, and uh, and sometimes it, it got very near to Christmas time uh, before some people got the harvest in. And in uh, Scotland, that was general. So the crop by then, of course, was practically ruined. So it could be hard work. And of course you had to pull the binders and the reapers, everything by horse. Oh yes, yes. How long would it take you to, A, to plough the acreage you needed to plough with horses and B, to then mm. harvest that acreage with horses? Yeah, I, I can't remember. I do remember that in harvest time, we had eight weeks holiday, school holiday, uh, and we were harvesting, and it seemed to be day in and day out. You know, no rain for it was Beautiful days, and during the war... They were perfect uh, harvest days and, and the winter. We got snow, of course, in the winter, which is okay. Yeah, the weather, weather was out of this world. It really was. And, of course, we worked every day, you see. We worked with the man. We never worked on a Sunday until after, after the war. Not many people did at all. Very, very few. We got the first uh, combined harvester, a man called Slade. And he had two of these Massey Harris tractor-drawn, they had an engine, a 20 horsepower engine to drive the combine and then you pulled it with a tractor and it was a side cut, 10 foot to, uh, cut and a 2 foot drum. It was it, rather rather difficult and you had a man on the combine and that was late in the late years, I, I did that. Uh, that was our first combine. Because you had to have somebody with uh, sorting the bags out as well, didn't you, on the combines then? Uh, well, this was a tanker. That was a tanker, was it? It was a tanker. We were also lucky, uh, we were given... Uh, permission to uh, buy a, a, a Massey combine, a self-propelled one. I think it was about two years before I left school, so it would be about 41, 1941 came, and it was self-propelled, and my brother, uh, he, he drove it, uh, and it was a Massey Harris, and th they came in a box, and there were 900 and some odd pounds. <laughs> <laughs> we also put a Turner Oxford uh, grain dryer in, uh, and it, it would dry three tonnes an hour, and, you know, we've used the dresser, the, the dresser part of it, we've used it up to this year. Really? Yes, all those years. Good. Yeah, good. now it's good, isn't it? And how much would a new combine cost you now? Well, the last one we bought was just a bit over 300,000. <laughs> from yeah. 900 quid? Yeah, from 900 pounds, yeah. <laughs> Mind you, there's a big discount on them now. Well, there wants to be, is not there? <laughs> yeah. So, so in the days just before you either, you, you know, you got the combines, you were still with the binders. Yeah. What about the thrashing? I mean, did you have your own machines? Yes, uh, that's a point. Uh, we had um, a Foster, I think. It was a Foster, yeah. Traction engine. We had a full threshing set. Father bought that in about 1916, I think. And at the same time, we had a blacksmith on the farm, as, as, a, as a farm worker, uh, and a carpenter as well. And the carpenter, uh, uh, Charlie Chapman, he drove the steam engine. 
and uh, he understood them as well. When we finished with the steam engine, uh, they were going for scrap just before the war, and anywhere around 10 to 20 pounds, uh, I suppose. And we got 75 pounds for ours, and it went on the aerodrome to build the aerodrome at Bimbrook. Really? The first aerodrome uh, that was built around here. And before the end of the war, we had 41, 41 aerodromes here, nearest uh, place to Germany. Cracking. Truly amazing. And your, and your traction engine went up there? It went there to pull trees out, uh, get ready for the building of the aerodrome and the tracks and so on. Yeah. <laughs> There's been a big interest, and still is, I believe, in, in traction engine preservation in this area of the Wolds, isn't there? I mean, the, the Haxbys, for instance, used to, ha- oh, used yeah. to keep them, didn't they? Yes, uh, uh, different people had them, and, uh, and in the flatter land, of course, they had the ploughing engines, where they had a, um, an engine on either side of the field, and then the, the plough or the, uh, the cultivator were attached to it to pull it backwards and forwards across the field. Can you remember that? Yes, I can. I can. Uh, they weren't used on the on the hills because it was it was uh, you know it cut the ropes so going over a, a bow, bow of a hill you could do, but uh, they weren't. They were used on the flatland. Very successful too, and of course you could deep plough with those. You know, um, they had a three for a deep plough or six, seven for a shallow plough. And I'm just a reversible ploughs they were, so they, they went down one way and came back on the same side, turned all the soil the same way. In other words, yeah. When you think about it now, you, you to make the comparison, and you see, I mean, I, as I walk and drive yeah. around the walls now, and you see the kind of power that is in those fields mm. and the huge machinery that they're pulling behind them, the yeah. ploughs and the yeah. drags and the discs and so on. Yeah. I mean, it's completely, it's so different, it's untrue, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, it is. Well, when we're talking about quantities and things, uh, we, we combine up to uh, 120 acres uh, in a day now, and in the old days, when you're threshing, you get anywhere between uh, 30 quarters, which was uh, five, six tons, uh, and and uh, probably um, 90 quarters, which would be 20 tons in a day. Well, we're getting more than that in, in I was thinking, in half an hour now, maybe. <laughs> Certainly within an hour. Yeah. So if you're doing 120 acres in a day with one combine, mm. how many acres a day would you be doing in the old days? The grain was uh, uh, binded and then uh, stooped and then it, you forked it up, picked it, we'll call it picking, picked it onto loads, stacked it and in the war you couldn't stack much in the yards, they wouldn't let you put them in a heap, you see, so you'd stack them in the fields and then you pull the threshing drum between two stacks and you, you did one and then the other. So, so it was like, it was you like couldn't sp- really compare it. No, because it, it was splitting yeah. the whole thing into different yes. sections. That's yeah, right, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 What about the number of people working on a farm when you came here? I mean, it must be vastly different mm. now. Well, uh, there's 11 cottages uh, on each farm. So there's 22 cottages in Wall Newton that belong to the farm and were occupied by farm workers. In addition to the, uh, uh, the landlords here, they had two, one for a gardener and one for a chauffeur. And there were, there were a few other houses privately built, but most of them uh, were on the, for the farm. So the house went with the job. In, the, in those early days, it was three shillings a week. But when we started, uh, we stopped that. So we made it free, you see. So those, uh, those 22 men, and in the early days, you see, the sons of those men, they weren't, they weren't allowed to work on, on the f- same farm as the father. In, in other words, the, the farmer wouldn't employ the sons. No, they must go out to work. So they go out and, and, and lodge in the, in the foreman's house, uh, who, who uh, would keep probably up to six, six uh, single men. They were uh, looked after by the foreman's eldest daughter, who stayed at home to work in the house and help her mother to deal with all the food and everything. Why, why wouldn't they let sons work with their fathers? Because there was always a um, uh, uh, thing, you know, he'd, he'd either be favoured by his father or he'd be kicked in his pants every day, you know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> so uh, it, it wasn't done. It was when I started. Uh, uh, we took the boys on as well. Well, we needed them, you see. And in the wartime, you couldn't get anybody anyway. Farm labour in the old days was sort of driven by the seasons, wasn't it? People would perhaps stay for a year and then possibly move on. Mm. Yes, yes, that's true. In those days, we used to hire a man uh, for a year. 
and then uh, if everything went uh, all right and he, he was settled with, with you and you wanted to keep them on, um, you asked him, uh, each man separately, you asked them, are you staying on? If so, that would be for another year. You wouldn't expect the man to leave in between times unless something seriously went wrong, of course, and it, it would be a year's work in hand. Probably some nights there would be six men in the back, in our back uh, uh, passageway to the house seeking a job and my father would interview them uh, all. It'd say he only wanted one man, there'd be six, uh, at least six people come and apply for it. Uh, he, he would probably hire one or maybe he wouldn't hire any of them. He reckoned at one time there were very few families uh, you know, that he hadn't employed uh, some person out of it <laughs> in those years. But uh, normally they didn't leave, no. Yeah, looking back, uh, for instance, our, our shepherd, James Hall, and he came to us when he was 21 years old, the father. He'd had a different job every year he'd left school, so he'd be 14 to 21, and he, he stayed with us for the rest of his life. There was a particular time of year when farm labourers, if they were going to move, did move. Yes, that's true. It was a, a lady day. That was the end, beginning and the end of the year. It started on the uh, 6th of April and it finished on the 5th, uh, and that was the full year. It was called Lady Day, and uh, that's the time when farms usually change hands too. So it was a very important day. That didn't apply to uh, single men, because I think it was March the 21st or March the 22nd. That was their hiring day. So, you know, they came to a, a place like Louth on hiring day, as a lot of them did, and the farmers were there. And then on this day, uh, the single men would do the same thing and spend the day in Louth uh, Market, probably in Grimsby as well, uh, certainly in Lincoln they did. Was that still the case when you came into farming, Bob? Yes, but things changed uh, as times changed. Times were changing very quickly then. We're, everybody was getting mechanised. We're get, beginning to go out of livestock, realising that this is the driest part of the country. Surely uh, Manchester's only 90 miles away, and they get, tw uh, they get 60 inches of rain to our 25. Uh, they've got the feed, let them grow, uh, have the livestock, and we turned over to uh, just um, arable farming without the livestock. We don't have any livestock now. I haven't had for years and years. Of course, in this day and age, Bob, uh, the labour you have on the farm is massively reduced, isn't it? How many, do, how many do you reckon that you've got on the farm now? It's been reduced through the years, obviously, until uh, finally we got down to uh, two permanent members. And then, in addition to my son, who came in as manager... I still work on the farm, and we get uh, contractors to come as well, when necessary, at busy times. And that's really how we fill in. Of course, in this day and age, contractors going into farms is a big business, isn't it? It is a big business. Um, generally speaking, they're very good at it. Uh, hedging is something which uh, they can do possibly quicker than most people on the farms because they've done more of it and so on. They're generally well-taught uh, uh, people and and people who like doing the job. So it's, it's a good thing to do. So we always keep the machinery right up to date. We have the satellite, so we drive the uh, machinery through a satellite, which uh, is combined can go, uh, if, if the fields are a mile long, and some fields are, not here, but some fields are, and you can go across that field, uh, set it up at one end, and it won't be more than sort of, well, about five or six inches, maybe 10 inches out, at the other end, <laughs> even on a hillside and, and all that. It's marvellous, and you can tell all the farms which have got them because um, they're so straight, you couldn't drive a, a machine like that. I suppose that the cost of farming, with, with equipment as sophisticated as that, is, in the old days, all the cost was on labour, wasn't it? Mm. And now it's in machinery. That's right, yeah, it is. <laughs> it is very much so. The thing that brought that to mind was that I recently interviewed somebody who was offering a deal to farmers from um, the Michelin company. He was telling me that just to put a new set of tyres on one tractor can cost you about ten or fifteen thousand mm. pounds. This is very true that they're so expensive it's unbelievable. But what we've done with the uh, combine harvesters recently, we've had them on tracks, and the first one we had on John Deere on tracks was the first one I think they'd had in this country which was only about four years ago, maybe five years ago.
So that that's uh, that's uh, is the the weight on the land. It's uh, 38 meters between our uh, wheelings on the land, and we try not to run on the land in between because we don't plough any. You see, so we try and keep it free. We keep coming back to the, the horses, Bob, and we were talking there about the comparison with these days, and and you're keeping your machinery well up to scratch and up to date. In the days of the horses, there was a lot of maintenance went into horses, wasn't there? You couldn't just mm. sort of stick them in a stable and leave them at night and then no. expect them to work the next day. There was no, It was a big job looking after them. You had to be skillful, didn't you? The gears, what the, what the horses wear uh, to work in are called gears, including the, uh, the collar and the saddle. And there was a saddler in Louth. He was called Mr Speed. Uh, and we used to go and take so much saddlery uh, every weekend, probably on a Saturday if we were going into Louth anyway, uh, and leave it with him and pick it up the next week. And that's how, that's how it went on. There's always something he wanted doing, of course. All the horses wore bluffs, which was they couldn't see the, out the sides, just forward. They, they were used to that, of course. Uh, and the other aspect, uh, we used to buy, father used to buy horses coming up to two years old, they weren't normally broken in, some of them, until four years old. But we broke ours in at two years old. We used to break them in on the farm. The foreman would have a lead on them and probably one or two of us with him. And uh, about half an hour and the horse would be broken in. It's amazing how, how they came to, you know. You know, looking back, it, it's a different world, of course. They took a bit of feeding as well, though, because a big horse like that would eat some, wouldn't they? <laughs> they, they did indeed. Uh, and another funny thing about a horse, you could, take him, you could take him to the trough, but you couldn't make him drink. <laughs> if he didn't want to drink, nothing would make him drink. And that never did, so we never tried. But that was it. He'd, he'd always eat. Yeah, he'd always eat. Cut meat, we call the uh, oats when it was cut, from the sheaf. Oh, yes, the, and hay, of course. They always had hay. Hay racks are on the end of the, of the stable. And they were always tied up uh, when they were in, in the stable. Uh, horses had to be, of course. So they had the trough in front of them. That's where the uh, bag stuff, we called it, was put. And, and, the, and the hay loft uh, just above it always had hay in. So they wouldn't get hungry. How long was the horse's working life? Well, I suppose if a horse was uh, 20 years old, uh, it would be looked upon as old. So it would be ready for working after, in your case, what, about two years? Yeah, after two years, it would yeah. be put on uh, light jobs. So about eight, uh, 17 not, or 18 years it would work anyway. Yes, you would probably put, put on as a four horse, not in shafts, because uh, uh, that fr- frightens them sometimes when you lift the shafts up and so on to get them on. So he would be on the lighter jobs for a start, and then he would be put into the main uh, chain of, of horses. My father always had a horse, and the shepherd had a horse, I'm not cl- including those uh, uh, on the farm, that worked on the farm. And we, we normally had another horse, which uh, my eldest sister, she was keen on, on riding in the early days. And, of course, she worked on the farm as well. Do you still wish you had some horses? <laughs> well, actually, one, my youngest daughter, she's got five, <laughs> five horses. She lives down in uh, Tetbury, and uh, she teaches coach driving. <laughs> and um, she's had people from Japan and all over the place. She's always busy uh, with it. I was just leading back in a circle, back to something you told me a few weeks ago. We've been talking about horses, and then when you came here, you had the one, there was the one tractor. Oh, in fact, none when you first came, and then there was the one tractor. You were telling me about a deal I suspect you couldn't possibly do these days when you went and bought a very large number of tractors all in one go. Oh, yes. (laughs) Yeah, that's true. Yes, we we changed from Ford to, uh, oh, Nuffield. Nuffield, yeah, they were on the go then. Yeah, I bought seven tractors to replace the Fords. We'd had a a very bad patch of of Fords, and Ford wouldn't help us with them. So I said, well, that's all right. We we shan't be buying any more Ford tractors then. Oh, that must be, I don't know, 30 years ago, maybe more. Uh, So we we changed them, and I think we bought seven, and and I got eight, uh, one for discount. So you got an actual free tractor as a discount? Yeah, free tractor <laughs> as a discount, yeah. And they were good. They were good. And then when the, massive, when the Ferguson came out, of course, with the lift on, that was the first tractor to have a hydraulic lift. I mean, you know, we all went in for, uh, for Ferguson tractors. And they were pulled three, four, a three for a plough on this land. We had, uh, well, a lot of them. And what do you have now? John Deere. From all those years ago, when, from 
moved from cabinet making in mm-hmm. your in your pa- yeah. not you yeah. but your family in oh, the pa- yeah. past history through to being a bit of a farming mm-hmm. dynasty in this area, haven't you? I mean, and it's going to go on, isn't it? Do you think? Do you, or do you, can you see a day when there won't be a Dale farming? Well, no, I, I, I don't know. Um, it's difficult to say because uh, things uh, do change. Obviously, I'm getting older now, but um, I still enjoy what I do very much in the farm. But you're still very much involved, aren't you? Oh yes, oh, I'm very much involved. Yes, uh, <clears throat> which I, I enjoy doing anyway. Uh, lots.